Welcome to the Gospel Message Radio Program. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Wes Hepner, and today a special message. We're starting with the suffering and death of Jesus Christ by Pastor Brian Newfelt from Warman, Saskatchewan. We're blessed that he's willing to share this message about the suffering of Jesus, how he was alone, people left him, he was not treated fairly. I wonder if any one of us feels that way sometimes. Before we go into that message, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity on this radio program to share your word. We thank you that you sent your son to come into this world. Lord, he lived a perfect life. He was the perfect example and he gave his life. He suffered and died. Heavenly Father, help us now and this coming week, especially to think on that, to remember that, what you have done for us and to be thankful. Heavenly Father, let that thankfulness show in our lives that you've done everything for us. You've made it possible that we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Lord, I pray that this program would bless each listener. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Here's now the first part of the message by Pastor Brian Neufeld on Jesus Christ, the suffering and death. Matthew 27 verse 22 says, What then shall I do with Jesus? I have to answer that question. And you have to answer that question. In fact, that's a question that every person must answer. Yeah, when you look in the Bible, the Bible has many questions. And the first recorded words of of Satan in Genesis chapter 3 is a question to Eve about what God had told her. And the serpent asks, Did God really say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And in the same chapter, God's first question in the Bible was when he asked Adam, where are you? Of course, he knew where Adam was. He just wanted Adam to admit where he was and what he had done. The first question in the New Testament is man asking where Jesus is. In Matthew 2, the Magi or the wise men, they ask, where is he who has been born King of the Jews. There's many other important questions in the Bible. Jesus asked, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Paul asked, If God is for us, who can be against us? And the writer of Hebrews asked, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? But here in Mark is is a question that every person has to answer. What will I do with Jesus? In verse 1 it says, immediately in the morning or very early in the morning. I get a sense of urgency. A sense that this trial has been pushed through very, very quickly. And I also sense that there wasn't much time in investigating And that there was a goal or a mission in mind of these people involved with this consultation. And that mission was to crucify Jesus Christ. There was no defense from Jesus himself as he knew he had done nothing wrong. And it seems that they don't want to give him any opportunity to defend himself or get him to say something. Pilate tries And the question that is asked is this, are you the king of the Jews? And the answer that Jesus gives is it is as you say. All that we read here seems to come from one side and not both sides. Jesus said nothing because there was nothing wrong that he had done. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've been blamed, you've been accused, And you had nothing to do with the incident. And when a person feels helpless, you feel like you've been treated unfairly because they've not heard your side nor are they interested in listening to you. And in our own eyes, when we look at what Jesus has been through, it must have felt pretty hopeless. First of all, he's rejected by his disciples. Then he's denied by a close friend, Peter. And here we see that the whole council has condemned him. And now he's going to go face the Roman authorities who have no mercy and then off to a very hostile 
crowd. In verse 3 it says that the chief priest accused him of many things. What were those things? Luke 23 verse 2 it mentions three things. We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying he himself is Christ the King. The first accusation basically was a complaint that involved disturbing the peace. The second accusation was a direct lie. If you turn to Luke chapter 20, verses 20 to 26, it says, And they watched him and sent four spies, which would, or which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, so that they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. It is lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no. But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and subscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. We read that the religious leaders and spies, they watched Jesus very, very closely. And their aim was that they wanted to trap him. They wanted to catch him and have proof that would make him look like a rebel so that they could hand him over to the Roman government. And the question they asked him was, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus asked them, show me a Daenerys. And then he asked Whose picture is on it? And they said, Caesar. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. It says that they marveled, and they were astonished at the answer that Jesus gave them, and they didn't say anything. Now here's another so-called accusation where they had no proof to blame him for committing something that he had done wrong. And again, we see that Jesus didn't give an answer because he hadn't done anything wrong. As much as they wanted to accuse him, they found nothing. And lastly, they accuse him of, for saying that he himself is king of the Jews. When Pilate asked Jesus if he is king of the Jews, Jesus replies and says, it is as you say. Now we look at these few verses and in our minds we see unfairness. Jesus has done nothing wrong and is being blamed. Now when you and I, we look around in the world today and I believe that we would say the same thing, that we live in an unfair world. And it's strange how, how quickly not only us as adults see unfairness, but children are aware that life is unfair as well. Just listen to what children have to say, and it's not long before you hear the words, it's not fair. Someone has more candy, a bigger present. Maybe they have to go to bed earlier than their brothers or sisters, or it's their turn to shower first. Or especially if they can't do something that they want to do, and of course, everybody else can. We hear the words, it's not fair. We can hear ourselves sometimes say, maybe saying to God, maybe to our friends or to ourselves, and think the same thing. It's not fair. And you know what? You're probably right. It isn't. But ask Jesus, because he knows. He lived a perfect life, harmed no one, healed countless people. He fed the hungry, he preached the good news, and he performed many, many miracles. And yet he was falsely arrested. Now a person gets this feeling that the, that the verdict had already been agreed upon before the evidence had even been put together. And yet he was innocent of any wrongdoing. I don't know about you, but I too have had to protest my innocence, being questioned for things that I haven't done. 
And it makes you feel unloved, mistreated, makes you feel isolated and alone. And I've thought to myself, life is unfair. So how do you cope with unfairness? Do you stay quiet and say nothing? I know for many of us it would be difficult, especially when we've done nothing wrong. But what did Jesus do? He answered nothing. There is no scene that is more remarkable or amazing than Jesus remaining silent before the men who were insulting him. And with one quick burst of power or word of rebuke, rebuke, Jesus could have had all those accusers laying flat at his feet. And yet he answered not one word, allowing them to say and do the very worst. You know, Jesus stood in the power of stillness. You know, there's a place of stillness that allows God the opportunity to work for us and give us peace. And it is a stillness that puts our scheming or proof in the search for a temporary means to an end through our own wisdom and judgment. And instead, it lets God provide an answer through his unfailing and faithful love to the cruel disappointment that we may have suffered. And yet, how often don't we prevent God to work on our behalf, to take up our own cause by being harsh with words on our defense? And yet, often we hinder or or don't allow God's intervention on our behalf by taking up our own situation into our own hands. Friends, sometimes there's a time to not say anything and to allow God to do the convicting. And other times, there may be a time to answer. Jesus always answered questions from anyone seeking the truth. But his silence was for those hearts and minds already made up. Heart of stone and the intent on killing him. These chief priests, they weren't interested in finding the truth. They wanted to get rid of him. And we need to remember that if we are in situations where we are blamed, we never need to face that situation alone. Jesus is always with us, and he will either give us the right words or the courage to remain silent. And yet the Bible tells us that Jesus was made perfect by his sufferings. Yet it seems strange that Jesus being perfect, good, and holy could be made even more perfect through suffering. But somehow God, he used all these unfair experiences in the life of his son to bring out even more perfection. Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. In Hebrews 5, 8, 9, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus completely identifies and understands with those of us who are suffering unfairness, who are going through pain or loneliness or hatred. And he identifies that because that unfairness happened to him. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Thanks so much to Pastor Brian Newfeld for that first part of Jesus' suffering and death. We'll have the next part next week. I hope you can be here for that. And this week, just take some time to remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you and to be thankful and to praise him, glorify him. I wish you a wonderful next week. My name is Wes Hepner. God bless you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>